while they're doing that, I want to just uh, bring your attention to an announcement inside your bulletin that I wanted to share with you. We have an upcoming series that is going to start July 7th. It's called Answering Faith's Hard Questions. We're going to tackle a number of questions that, I don't know about you, but as a father with my daughters growing up, they had a number of questions. Uh, how, how do I know who God is? And uh, how do I know I can trust the Bible? Those kinds of questions. Questions not only children are asking, but we ask as well, right? And so what I want to do is take some time and walk through a series of messages, 10 messages with, messages with you, and talk about, is God real? Who is this God that we talk about, the God of the Bible? Is the Bible really God's Word? Is it really God's Word? How do I know that? My, da- my daughter had a conversation, or actually her husband had a conversation with another gentleman not too long ago that made the comment, you know, the Bible is just a, a book. It's been copied over and over and over. Nobody can trust it. It's been changed. Well, is that really true? Or is it really God's unchanged Word? We're going to answer some of those questions as we walk through that. What does it mean to be saved? That is one of the most profound questions that it seems like everybody thinks they know the answer to, but you'll be surprised how many people say, I do not know what it really means to be saved. So we're going to walk through some important questions. I'll leave that to you to walk through there. But that's going to be a series of 10 messages we're looking forward to launching here July 7th. So I just want to bring that to your attention. And there may be some times there you want to invite somebody to come to walk, to walk through and listen to some of these messages. Is Jesus really the only way to heaven? Or is he not? Those are great questions. Is heaven real? Is hell real? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But we're going to walk through. And Scripture talks about some of those things. So be sure to invite your friends to be a part of that. And what I want to do is I want to gear these messages in such a way that your kids are asking questions or maybe your grandchildren are asking questions. And you can take these notes and say, you know, let me help you understand the answer to these questions. So it'll be a great time. All right. Will you pray with me? Father, as you open your word again, we ask that you would lead us. As I think about David's life and he penned this great psalm, Psalm 23, that, Lord, you would teach us through his life, his words, that you inspired him, Lord, to write in your word. I pray now, guide us. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm one of those guys that likes uh, trivia information. And I had a question the other day, and I thought, you know, this is a great question. So I went on Google, and I said, you know, Google, I said, how many, I know you're going to think this is strange, but if you know me, you won't think that's strange. How many books are there in the world? I have a couple of libraries, and I have a lot of books. In fact, I'm trying to downsize books, and it's really hard to get rid of books. You ever, if you like books, you know what, that, what that's like. But I asked Google, I said, how many books are there in the, in, the, in the world? So Google researchers came together. They collected their data. They figured out that there are roughly 130 million books, 130 million books in the modern world, that every year that number grows by about 2.2 million books. In fact, in the U.S. alone, there are some 65,000 to 100,000 books that are published every year. Of those, only about 250 or so uh, copies are sold. Not very many when you think about it. But what I'm really impressed about, and the reason why I asked that question, is because the number one book, the most published and widely circulated book in history and the world, hands down, is the Bible. Did you know that in the last 50 years that there have been more than 3.9 billion copies of the Bible sold in the last 50 years? It is the most widely circulated, the most popular book that has ever been written. You know what that means? It means step aside, Shakespeare, step aside, John Grisham, step aside, Clive Custler and Louis L'Amour. God is still the number one best-selling author of all time. Not surprising, is it? Because he's God. But the Bible, hands down, is the most popular, the most widely published book that has ever been written. By the way, 50 years, 3.9 billion books. You know what that is per year? That's 78 million books a year, Bibles that are sold, unparalleled to any other book. Now, why is the Bible so popular? Well, for starters, it is the only authorized autobiography God has ever written. In fact, in the Old Testament alone, it says more than 2,600 times that this is God's word. He declares it to be his word. 
And no other book makes this claim nor can support it. The Bible, like no other book, speaks with the proven authority on the most difficult and controversial subjects ever known to mankind. Who is God? Jesus Christ. Angels. Satan. Heaven. Hell. Life. Death. Life after our gra- uh, the grave. Mora- mortality. Morality. Relationships. Marriage. Raising children. Finances. Business. Law. Politics. And the list goes on and on and on. The Bible is the voice of God that speaks with his full authority on many, many, many subjects. Years ago, I read about a man who had spent more than 42 years of his life, an expert in Sanskrit language, in other words, Eastern language books. He studied the sacred books of the East, and he studied the Bible. Listen to what he said. He said, pile them up, if you will, on the left side of your study table, that is the sacred books of the East, But place your own Bible, your own Holy Bible, on the right side, all by itself, alone. And with wide gap between them, for there is a gulf between it, the Bible, and the so-called sacred books of the East, which severs one from the other, utterly hopeless and forever. A veritable gulf which cannot be bridged over by any science of religious thought. By the way, he's not the only one who says that. Throughout generation after generation after generation who have studied the Bible, they say again and again, the Bible is the leading authority on life. But you know what I find is interesting about the Bible is I read my Bible, I find something very fascinating. Not only is this an expert authority on many of the topics that are the most controversial and confusing in all mankind, but I find when I read my Bible, it is very down to earth. Did you ever notice that? It does not sugarcoat the truth. It tells it like it is. It speaks very plainly. It speaks very honestly. And one of the things I notice about the Bible as I read through it is that it tells the truth very candidly about some of the most colossal failures of its celebrated saints. God tells the truth about the blunders, the failures of the most famous people, the greatest believers in the Bible. Take, for instance, Moses. Did you know that your Bible is written by murderers? Moses was a murderer. David was a murderer. Paul was a murderer. And yet, all three of those men wrote a good portion of the Bible. Not only was Moses, the great man of God, a murderer, but he also violated, that is, he refused to obey God's command out of a fit of anger. And in doing so, he was not permitted to enter the the promised land. Now, here's the great man of God, Moses, and yet God speaks very candidly about his blunders in life. Take Elijah, the mighty prophet Elijah, for instance. He courageously and single-handedly confronted 450 false prophets of Baal all by himself and destroyed them. And after he did that, he heard the whispering threat of wicked Queen Jezebel against his life, and his courage melted, and he ran as fast as he could the other way. God tells it like it is. I think of David, whom the Bible says is a man after God's own heart. David, after he slew the mighty giant Goliath, later in his life would then commit adultery with the pretty wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. And not only to make matters worse, to bring great, greater pain in her life and his life and his own family's life, he murders Uriah. I think of the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter. The Apostle Peter is known as the rock. That's what his name means, by the way, Petros. But he really was more like a pile of sand than he was a rock. Because Peter was the guy, if you remember, when Jesus was about to be arrested, he said to Jesus, he said, listen, Jesus, I will go to prison for you. I will die for you. And then when Peter was confronted with the real threat of what it meant to follow Jesus, he melted. His courage disappeared. And he brazenly denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. You see, the Bible tells it like it is. Whether Moses or Elijah, David or Peter, God doesn't hide their failures. 
Instead, the Bible does something more. God is showing us something more significant. God does not hide their failures, but rather he overcomes them. He shows us that he's not simply the ultimate authority on many controversial topics, but he is also the ultimate authority on turning our, uh, the pain of, pain of our failure into something that is good. God has that ability to bring good out of our pain. The fact is, as I read my scriptures and I read many of your lives and my life as well, I find that every one of us have experienced failures, setbacks, disappointments. In fact, there's not one of us, I don't think, that is here that has not felt the discouragement of life falling apart, the pain of disappointment. And sometimes pain and discouragement, disappointment, completely overwhelms us, doesn't it? Like Job in Job 17, Job said this, he said, My days are over. My hopes have disappeared. My heart, my heart's desires are broken. My days, my hopes, my desires shattered, shattered. Maybe you had that kind of a week. Maybe you felt discouraged and disappointed. And the week passed and the month behind you. This, uh, this morning I want, to, I want to take a moment and look at God's answer to our failures. And I want to look at Psalm 23. And I want to look at just one verse in Psalm 23, verse 3, where David says this. He says, He restores my soul and he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restores my soul and he guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. This little poem, Psalm 23, was written by a man who is well acquainted with the sting of failure, David. And what I find that is fascinating about the life of David is this, is that God intentionally and permanently etched in David's blunders and failures in his word for all the world to see. David lived some 3,000 years ago, and yet we still read as though it was today's news about David's adulterous affair with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah, and the blunders in his life. Why did God do that? Is it to embarrass David to speak about his shame? Not at all. God's purpose is not to embarrass David, but rather to show how, us how he healed David and how he can do the same thing for us. Can I tell you something about your failure and your discouragement and your disappointment that you face? There's time, there are times in our lives when we face discouragement, we face disappointment, and we feel utterly hopeless to change. One of the greatest lies that Satan will ever throw at us is this. You will never change. You cannot change. You're stuck. And the reason I think that God is so painfully honest about David's blunders, his failures, and all the rest of the saints is not to embarrass them, but rather to help us understand that God can change even the deepest wounds, the deepest disappointments in our lives if we let Him. And you know that's exactly what David is saying in Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. As we look at this one little verse, I think David is showing us a couple of answers to our own failure, remedies to deal with how we face our own disappointment. There are very two simple steps here I want to give you. One is this, is to ask God for, to heal you from your brokenness. Ask God to heal your brokenness. Second is to trust God to direct your choices. So ask Him to heal your brokenness. Trust Him to direct your choices in your life. The first one is this, simply this, is ask God to heal your brokenness. David says, he restores my soul. What does the word restore mean? 
Restore implies that something's been broken, something's been damaged, and only things that are broken need to be restored. Only things that are damaged need to be restored. And all of us, I think, have been damaged in life in some way or other by either our dumb choices or the choices of others. I don't know about you, but I've noticed that life has a way of breaking us. Doesn't it? That pain, the pain of brokenness, is a universal leveler. It is an equal opportunist. Not one of us are immune. It has no fear or regard of people or ages. And yet God says, He restores our souls. The picture that David is painting here is through the lens of a shepherd. Psalm 23 is about a shepherd and how we are like sheep. And so what he has in mind here, the words that the picture that he's painting with these words is like a sheep that is in danger and needs to be rescued. In his classic book, Philip Keller, a shepherd, looks at Psalm 23. Keller himself was a pastor, but he was also a sheep herder for over eight years. And he says that what David is talking about here is that there are, is a condition which shepherds know that sheep are what they call cast down or downcast. It has the idea that sheep are in danger and they need to be rescued. They cannot rescue themselves unless the shepherd rescues them. He says, here's what happens. He says, a heavy, fat, or long fleece sheep will lie down comfortably in some little hollow or depression in the ground. It may roll slightly on its side and stretch out to relax. You can just see that, can't you? <laughs> and suddenly, the center of gravity in the body shifts so that it turns on its back far enough that the feet no longer touch the ground. It may feel a sense of panic and start to paw frantically. Frequently, this only makes matters worse. It rolls over even further. Now it is quite impossible for it to regain its feet. And left in this helpless position, are you sick of looking at a sheep behind me? I knew that was coming. I thought it was going to totally distract you. Don't you feel like that sometimes? That's what David is saying, that sometimes life throws us down and we're downcast. We're stuck on our back. We're helpless to get back up on our feet. We're spiritually cast, if you will, helpless and embarrassed. We need God to deliver us. And that's what David is doing. He's looking at his own life through the lens of a shepherd. And he says, you know, that's what my life has been like. David was a seasoned shepherd. Many a time he had rescued sheep that were cast down. And he says, God, that's what my life has been like. There are times in my life that I look back, because he wrote this psalm as an older man. There are times I look back in my life that I was cast down. That I found myself on my back. And what happens to a sheep when they get on their back and they start pawing frantically to the air and they can't get up on their feet is that all the gases in their system begin to uh, squeeze off the blood flow. And so that left in that condition for even just a few hours, they will die unless they're rescued. And David is saying, that's exactly what my life has been like, God. There are times in my life that I was on my back, I was helpless, spiritually cast, and unless you rescued me, I was never going to survive. David knew exactly what he was talking about here because there were times when he was spiritually cast down, discouraged, broken. But what I noticed about David is this. As I look at those times in his life when he was the most cast down are the times that he least went to God. When he had had his young adulterous fling with Bathsheba and David knew he was in trouble. For a year he tried to stay quiet about what he had done. For a year. David knew he had blown it. Did he go to God right away? No, he tried to avoid God. I don't know if you've ever done something wrong in your life and you have a guilty conscience and everybody that looks at you think, oh, they know, I can tell. Do you ever know that? Now imagine that's what that year was like for David as he was walking through his castle, as people looked at him, he'd go, oh, that person knows. I think they, they just, I just think they know. 
You see, a guilty conscience has a way of haunting you that way. It was Francis Bacon who said this, a clear conscience is a continual feast. And all you have to do is have a guilty conscience to know what a continual feast, a clear conscience really is. A clear conscience is a soft pillow to lay your head on every night. A clear conscience is invaluable. David did not have a clear conscience. For over a year, he wrestled in his guilt. He wrestled in his shame. He wondered in every relationship he had, do they know? How much do they know? And guilt ate at him and destroyed him. He said it only took seconds of passion, misguided passion, to undo years of a godly walk with God. One author observed this. He said, moral collapse is seldom a blowout. It is more like a slow leak, the result of a thousand small indulgences, the consequences of which are not immediately apparent. We are seduced, he said, by sin's attraction and led only by subtle degrees. You see, we don't fall into failure. We transition into failure. Transition into failure is the frog in the kettle. You never notice the water getting warmer and warmer and warmer until it is too late. So now the great hymn writer and singer of Israel became the great seducer and adulterer. And what did he do? Naturally, he tried to hide it. He tried to cover it up. He spent a year trying to justify and cover up his sin, but it didn't last. The Bible says this, and we should take warning as we hear this. The Bible warns us that your sin will find you out. Your sin will find you out, and David's sin found him out. A year after he had struggled with the guilt and the shame, the remorse of what he had done, not only committing uh, adultery, but murdering Uriah. A year had gone by, he was still tormented. And his good friend and prophet, Nathan, confronted him. And what I find is absolutely amazing about God's relationship with David is this. When you read 2 Samuel chapter 12, something amazing happens. Nathan confronts David. He says, David, you're the man. You sinned. You blew it. And David says, you're right. And here's what is amazing that happens when you read that passage. No sooner does David begin to confess. He says, you're right. I've blown it. I've sinned before God. He barely has the words out of his mouth. Then God literally interrupts him and says, David, I forgive you. I forgive you. You see, God is looking for a heart that is seeking him, that is broken and looking for forgiveness. And before you can even get those words out, asking for God's forgiveness, God says, I want you to know I forgive you. I'm ready to forgive you. I'm like the prodigal father waiting for his son, looking at the horizon, waiting for that small speck of his son coming up on the horizon, returning home, coming to his senses, realizing his sinfulness, realizing his need for a father to forgive and to love. And God says, I am that father. And I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. No matter what it is, I want you to know I already know what it is, and I'm waiting for you to say, God, you're right. I can't hide from this anymore. I need your forgiveness. David gave us insight into his life during that year of struggle and torment. In Psalm 32, he said this, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained. Guilt and shame, remorse were eating him alive. He was cast down in helplessness like a sheep that needed rescuing. And then he said this in Psalm 32. He said, I acknowledged my sin to you. In my iniquity, I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave my sin. 
You see, barely had David even gotten that confession out, then God forgave him. It doesn't mean there weren't consequences, grave consequences to David's sin in his life, to his family. But God is saying this, I am ready to rescue you the moment you ask me to heal your brokenness. Can I ask you a question? Why is it we're so like David? Why is it that we're so afraid to confess to God our brokenness? Why is that? I think one is pride. The other, I think, is we're, we're, we're afraid of being found out by God. God, if you really knew how horrible a person I am, what I've done, you would never forgive me. And God says, Oy vey. How many times do I have to tell you, I already know. God knows everything about you. That's why I marvel at passages like Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where it says God chose us in Him before the foundations of the earth. Do you know what that means? God is saying that God chose you to be His child even before you had the opportunity to know what sin was. And Him full knowing not only the sins of your past, the sins of your present, He knows the sins of your future. And yet He says, nonetheless, I know it all. And I not only forgive you, but I love you and I want to heal you. But I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you to turn to me and ask me to heal your brokenness. Sometimes I think we're afraid that we've pushed it too far. And God would never forgive us. But the Bible says this, God promises us that he will never reject a broken or contrite heart. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter whether it's the 8,000th time you've messed up and you've blundered. God says that when you come to me and you have a broken and contrite heart, when you genuinely ask for my healing, my forgiveness, I will give it. David knew that because later on he wrote in Psalm 51. Listen to what he said. He said, the sacrifices of God are broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Would you remember that? If you don't hear anything else today, I want you to take this one thing home. The moment you blow it in the days to come, and discouragement begins to weigh heavily on you, and you think there's no way God can forgive me, I've blown it again, again. Never forget that God says, when you come to me and you genuinely ask for forgiveness, I will forgive you. If you don't remember anything else from today, don't forget that. Stay armed with that truth that God wants to heal you when you truly come to him. Jesus had a conversation once with Peter. You remember the story. Peter comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, he says, how many times should I forgive somebody? Now, the Pharisees had a rule. You forgave somebody three times, kind of like our law. Three times you strike out and that's it. And so I imagine Peter thinking, you know, I'm going to be better than the Pharisees, if you could be better than the Pharisees. He said, how many times should I forgive somebody, Jesus? Seven times? What did Jesus say? Seven times, 70 times. Now, just to be careful so that you mathematicians don't get this wrong, he's not saying that you forgive somebody 490 times and then you let them have it. He's not saying that. He's saying that when you forgive, that should be such a condition of your heart that when you're offended by someone, you're ready to forgive again, again, and again, and again. Why? Because that's the heart of God toward the person who is genuinely repentant of their sin when they come to him. And God says, never forget that when you have a broken and contrite heart and you come to me, you will not be despised. You see, I think one of the greatest things that God despises is a self-righteous heart, a pride. It was the great reformer and theologian John Calvin who said it so well and so simply. He said, the first step in obtaining the righteousness of God is first to renounce our own righteousness. 
You see, one of the worst things you could ever do is stand before God and say, God, you know, I blew it over here, but I'm really good over here. Aren't you proud of me? God says, you don't understand. All of us have blown it. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing good you can do that God says, now that is pretty close to getting you to heaven. Do a couple more of those and you might make it. The Bible is very clear. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Would you say that with me? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does all mean? All, right? Not most, not a high percentage, not a super majority, but all. And if I read all properly, that means all. And that means you. And that means me. See, what David learned, what we need to learn as well, is one of the things that God despises more than anything else is a self-righteous, haughty heart. A heart that looks at other people and says, you know, I'm not nearly as bad as that person. I'm far better than that person. And I certainly didn't do or say what that person did. God despises those kinds of hearts that think they're somehow better than everybody else. Because all means all. Means all. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus tells a story once about a Pharisee, a tax collector in Matthew chapter 18. He says a Pharisee and this tax collector came before the temple to pray one day. And the Pharisee, as he came to the temple, as he stood there, he said to God, God, I thank you that I'm not like all these other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. But the tax collector, Jesus said, stood at a distance away. And was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Listen, you will never know the healing of God in your life until you're honest about your own brokenness. You'll never know God's restoration and forgiveness until we humbly ask Him to heal our brokenness. Can I ask you a question? Have you asked God for that healing? Or maybe a better question would be, what is it that's holding you back from that? Is it pride Is it fear? Is it believing somehow the lie that God may not know all the things about you? Let me assure you, God knows it all. And He's waiting to heal you when you ask Him. So David, first of all, I think is telling us this, is to ask God to heal us of our brokenness. David certainly understood that. He knew whereof he spoke. Second is to trust God to direct our choices. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David penned these words more than 3,000 years ago. This is ancient, ancient stuff. But what is amazing today, if you go to Israel, even now, and you look at the many surrounding hills of Israel, you will find his words of what he's writing here, the very picture that manifests in front of you. Because etched into the sides of these hills are hundreds, if not thousands, of sheep pathways on these hills that have been there for generation after generation after generation. And sheep herders have oftentimes followed the same path that their grandfather followed, their great-grandfather followed, their great-great-grandfather followed for generation after generation after generation. If you go there today and you ask a shepherd, how long has this path been in your family? He might tell you this path has been in our family for 600 years. And David is saying this, is that he he guides me in the paths of righteousness. He's using the language of a shepherd who says this, listen, I know the path I'm leading you on. 
I know it like the back of my hand. And unlike us Westerners, you don't drive sheep, you lead sheep. And what he's saying here is that as he guides us, being our shepherd who leads us, he already sees where the path is going. He already anticipates the danger, the trouble that is in front of us and deals with it before we even get there. So he guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He's saying that I know where you're going. I've already been there. And I'm already preparing the way for you to make sure that you safely make it to your destination. That's what David is saying when he writes these words. But let me ask you this question. Why is it then when we say to God something like this in moments in our life, God, I'll follow you for the rest of my life. I'm all yours. But five minutes later, something happens in our life and we find that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. We say, God, thank you, but I'll take it from here. What is that about us? That we're so prone to wandering, so easily distracted. You know what it is? Very simple. It's because you're like a sheep. There's no more fitting image in Scripture, I don't think, than the Bible says that we are like sheep, prone to wander. All of us are. Isn't that true of you? There's a great hymn that we sing in which we confess to God, God, my heart is always prone to wander. Is that true of your heart? So God says, I know you need a shepherd. But this shepherd is the one who leads us. And we follow his paths of righteousness. What this means is really the path of right living. And when you follow God and you follow his path, his right path for you, there are benefits. There are, are byproduct of following God in your life. The benefit of peace and security and joy. When you walk in God's path, God says you're going to experience security. You're going to experience joy. You're going to experience peace. Why is that? Because we're following the path that God has for us. It's what the author of Hebrews has in mind when he said this in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. He says that we are to fix our eyes on Jesus. Why? He says because Jesus is the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. He's using the same language of David. He's saying this, that God is the one who wrote the book on your life. He's the one who shepherds your life. He knows everything in advance before it's going to happen. He knows the best route to take you. That's the safest way to go. If you follow him, you're going to experience peace and joy and security. So he says, when you follow him, you're going to know. But I think one of the most difficult struggles we have is that we want to stray and do our own thing, isn't it? We want to get out of God's path for us that he has planned for us. That's what Isaiah says in Isaiah 6. He says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was talking about sheep, and one of you went, bah. And I thought, you know, how fitting. Because that's exactly what we are. We are all like sheep. But listen to what David says. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. For his namesake. What does that mean? He's simply saying this, that when we commit to following God's path for us, he will reveal his love and care for us along the way. You've all experienced that. Where you've had some dilemma, some struggle, some, some major decision, and you said, God, I'm just going to commit my way into your hand, whatever you're going to do. And the moment you did that, as God began to open doors that you didn't even know were there before, you began to experience his love and his care for you. What was he doing? He was bringing glory to his name for his name's sake. So when we commit to follow God, he's going to reveal his love and care for us. This came home in a very poignant way for me not long ago. And an amazingly true story that for years had been contained in the records of the United States Naval Institute of an event that followed World War II, or actually at the end of World War II. A man by the name of Gary Laferla uh, made this story known in his book called Finding Your Way. It's an amazing story. In 1944, 
as the story goes, the USS Astoria was engaged with the Japanese during a battle for the Savo Island before the ships from the U.S. Naval Fleet had arrived. During this crucial night of battle, the Astoria scored several direct hits on the Japanese vessel, but it itself was badly damaged and would sink the following day. LaFarilla tells the rest of the story. He says this, about 0200 hours, that's 2 o'clock in the morning for those of you, a young Midwesterner, Sigelman, third class, Elgin Staples, was swept overboard by a blast when the Astoria's number one eight-inch gun turret exploded. Wounded in both legs by shrapnel and in semi-shock, he was kept afloat by a narrow life belt that he had managed to activate with a single trigger mechanism. About 0600 hours, four hours later, Staples was rescued by a passing destroyer and returned to the Astoria, whose captain was attempting to save the cruiser by beaching her. The effort failed, and Staples, still wearing the same life belt, found himself back in the water. It was lunchtime. He was picked up again, this time by the USS President Jackson. He was one of, one of 500 survivors of the battle who were evacuated from Numea. On board, the transport staples, hugging the life belt with gratitude, looked at this small piece of equipment for the first time. He scrutinized every inch of the life belt that had served him so well. It had been manufactured, he noticed, by Firestone Tire and Rubber Company of Akron, Ohio, and bore a registration number. Given home leave, Staples told his story and asked his mother, who worked for Firestone, about the purpose of the number on the belt. She replied that the company insisted on personal responsibility for the war effort, that the number was a unique and assigned was unique and assigned to only one inspector. Staples remembered everything about the life belt and quoted the number. There was a moment of stunned silence in the room. And then his mother spoke. She said, that was my personal code that I affixed to every item I was responsible for approving. God tells us this, that when you commit your way to me and you trust me to guide your paths, I write my, resi my, my registration number on you I affix it to you, and I personally watch out for you for the rest of your life. Can I ask you a question? Have you come to God and said, God, would you heal me of my brokenness? Have you come to him and said, Lord, I'm going to trust you from this day forward to be my guide in my life? I know it won't always be easy. I know it won't always make sense. But God, I'm committed to trust in you. The psalmist said this, commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust in him and he will help you. Some of you have already committed your life to Christ. But I sense many of us need to be restored. We need to come back to God and say, God, would you heal what is broken in my life? Would you give me a heart of belief that you can overcome this? And maybe there are blunders and failures in your life, regrets, and you wonder, God, can I ever overcome these? God says, yes, you can, if you trust me. Ask me for my healing. Trust me to guide your paths, and I will. Will you pray with me? With your heads bowed, where you're sitting right now, some of you have committed your life to following the Lord, and you know well what it means to follow in his path and experience his peace, his security, his joy in your life. But maybe you found yourself strained, wandering away lately. 
and God is pulling at your heartstrings, reminding you it's time to turn back. You've wandered too far, too long. Will you return to the shepherd? Will you come to him this morning and say, Lord Jesus, would you forgive me, Lord, for wandering yet again? Oh, I'm so tired of a heart that is prone to wander. But Lord, I ask, in your great love, would you forgive me yet again and draw me close to yourself? Would you guide me in your paths for your name's sake? Maybe you're here this morning, you've never personally trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never come to God personally and said, God, I'm asking you, will you be my personal shepherd? Will you forgive me of my sins? Will you forgive me for my wandering, my blunders, my failures? Will you heal the hurts that are deep in my life? And Lord, would you put me on the path that you planned for me long ago, your path of righteousness? Would you guide me to walk in your ways? Show me what it means to stay on that path. and Let me hear your voice, that I recognize the voice of my shepherd. Give me eyes to see, to follow your lead, and a will to commit to go wherever you lead. Thank you, Jesus. I pray these things in your strong name.